What would you say that this is? Very good. What words would you use to describe it? Take a moment to think if you'd like. What words would you use to describe it? Ma'am? Yes. Rustic? Simple? Wooden? Suffering. Suffering. Oh. Empty? I was given this assignment when I was a seminary student a few <clears throat> years ago. We were asked, what is this? Write down your description of it. So I looked at it, took it all in, considered it, thought about it. And then I wrote down that it's a cross, about 16 inches tall, made of wood, brown, with about a seven inch cross piece. Then the professor, after giving us time to think about it, asked us to read aloud what we had written. And I don't remember the exact words of the first person who shared, but she said something like this. I see a miniature version of the cross on which my Savior died. It represents sacrificial love and the depths to which God is willing to go to save us from ourselves and to reconcile the relationship that we, by our own sins, have broken. Embarrassed by my over-literal interpretation of the assignment, I slid down in my seat ever so slightly and thought, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> my description was not wrong, but the point of the exercise was to show how different people look at the same thing and see it differently. My answer to the question, what would you say that this is, says as much about me as it does the cross, which I try to describe. How we see something, anything really, depends in large part on our perspective and our experiences. Paul McCartney, I think, is a good example of this. Now, if I asked you to tell me who is Paul McCartney, what would you say? The Beatles, sure. He was a member of the Beatles, founding member of the Beatles. Most folks would know that. But he's also written or co-written 32 songs that went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. He's been recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most successful composer and recording artist of all time. He sold over 100 million albums, has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and along with his Beatles bandmates, was made a member of the Order of the British Empire. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. He's been awarded the Legion d'Honneur by Pres uh, French President Francois Holland. He has received a Kennedy Center honor been given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And in 1990, the International Astronomical Union named an actual planet after him. That's not one of those $15 name a star for your loved one things. That's real scientists named an actual planet. There's a McCartney floating around in the heavens somewhere. Paul McCartney is kind of a big deal. But when he performed at the 2012 Grammy Awards, hundreds of people turned to social media to post that they had no idea who he was. One of the trending topics on Twitter that night was, who is Paul McCartney? Who do you say that Paul McCartney is? One of the most accomplished musicians of all time or some old guy with a guitar? How you answer probably says more about you than it does about him. And we see this a lot in our public discourse. Who would you say that Barack Obama is? Or John Boehner? Or Woody Hayes? Or Brady Hoke? Or LeBron James? Is he the betrayer of Cleveland basketball or its savior? How you answer that question probably says more about you than it does about him. Which is what I think is so interesting about the two questions that Jesus asks of his disciples in our New Testament reading this morning. First, Jesus inquires, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples answer John the Baptist, or Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. These are, all in all, not bad answers. Each bears some resemblance to Jesus. John the Baptist is a fiery preacher who taught about the coming kingdom of God, and even Herod has said that he thinks Jesus is the son or is John the Baptist resurrected. 
Old Testament prophecy had predicted that the prophet Elijah would return at the end of times. The prophet Jeremiah had, like Jesus, had run-ins with the authorities and suffered rejection, and many of the other prophets had bravely spoken out against the powers that be and called for repentance and change, like Jesus. Each of these identities speaks to some aspect of who Jesus is, but none can approach the depth and complexity of the person he really is. Tom Long writes this about the people who have said these things. To the popular mind, he writes, Jesus is deja vu, John, Jeremiah, Elijah, or whoever. We've seen all this before, he writes. Nothing about Jesus is new, unique, or challenging. He's merely one of the old prophets recycled. The people have turned Jesus, who is a window into the kingdom of heaven, into a mirror. They look at Jesus, but see only the reflection of religious ideas from their past. But then Jesus asks the disciples, but who do you say that I am? To which Peter replies boldly, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Which is the answer that Jesus was looking for. Peter sees Jesus not as what has already been known, but as someone new, a singular person in his own right, the Messiah, the son of God. Peter understands that Jesus is not just a prophet, but the complete fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham so long ago when God first called Abraham to go to a land that I will show you. And he promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the grains of sand on a beach or the stars in the sky and that they would be a blessing to all nations. Of course, Jesus' identity is not news to us who have been reading along with Matthew because in the very first sentence of Matthew's gospel, he tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. And earlier in chapter 14, when Jesus walks on water and calms the wind, the disciples worship him saying, truly you are the son of God. So Peter's profession of faith does not give the reader any new information about Jesus, but it does tell us something important about Peter and by extension ourselves. His confession tells us that Peter knows Jesus intellectually and spiritually. He has lived with Jesus on a daily basis, listening to him teach the crowds that gather to hear him, watching him heal the sick and embody the love of God in his interactions with people every day. But he has also seen Jesus in the quiet moments, behind the curtain, so to speak, and knows that this is more than just a public persona. He knows that Jesus is the embodiment of God's grace and mercy and steadfast love. But Peter also knows Jesus spiritually. He's learned from Jesus by spending time with him and listening to him. But when Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, we understand that Peter's confession of faith is born more from more from more than just intellectual knowledge. This is something that's been laid on his heart by the Holy Spirit. And to his bold statement of faith, Jesus replies, On this rock, I'll build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, people have debated that last line ever since it was set down in print. The Catholic Church has always held that Peter was of primary importance to the early church and to this one. And that he, as the first bishop of Rome and all of his successors, have enjoyed a special place at the head of the church. Others, Protestants primarily, have argued that what Jesus said was the foundation of the church was not the person of Peter, but rather his profession of faith. The fact of the matter is that they're both partially right. Jesus is praising Peter specifically. We remember that the name Peter comes from the Greek word petros, which means rock, So Jesus is making a bit of a play on words here. That guy named Rock, he's going to be the foundation stone of my church. But it is Peter's faithful proclamation, his bold statement of faith, that makes him special to begin with. So while Peter was an important figure in the early church, it's his understanding of Jesus as Messiah and his willingness to proclaim the truth so boldly that will make him the blueprint for every Christian that follows him down through the ages. Who do you say that I am? Peter's answer does not tell us more about Jesus that we do not already know. 
We've read the rest of Matthew's gospel. We already know who Jesus is. Now, in the answer to that question, Matthew shows a vivid picture of who Peter is. He's the one who listens and learns at the feet of the master and who is moved by the power of God's Holy Spirit to follow and to be a disciple. And that he is the rock on which Jesus will build the church shows that if we are to be a part of the church, then we must strive to be like Peter too, which is quite the challenge. Except that Peter, as Matthew goes on to show us, is not just faithful and strong and well-meaning, but also fallible and weak in some ways too. In the very next chapter after this one, Peter, the foundation stone, will become a stumbling block. And this Peter who will answer Jesus' invitation to walk on water will also deny ever having known Jesus at his trial. But this Peter, in all his human frailty and bold faith, is the first in a long line of those who will compose the church of Jesus Christ. Peter is not the first pope. He is the first true Christian. And as such, he is the model for all who come after him. You see, the church is composed of millions of people who are, like Peter, willing to stand up and say boldly what we believe, but who are also, like Peter, fallible and sinful and weak sometimes. And when we add our voices to the chorus of those who've gone before us, we do so not as spectators or as simple pilgrims seeking our own salvation or our own spiritual fulfillment, for that matter. We do so as parts of a larger body whose role it is to implement the will of God. That's what Jesus' statement to Peter means. What you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. What you loose on earth, I will loose in heaven. That doesn't mean that somehow Peter and those who follow him have some say over what Jesus will do or what God's will will be. To the contrary, God is sovereign. God will do what God will do whether we like it or not. What Jesus is saying here is that the church has been given the responsibility for carrying out the will of God. Let that sit on your brain for a second. The church has been given the responsibility for carrying out the will of God. And to do so such that the church does so closely reflect God's will that it would be difficult to tell the difference. Now, obviously, we don't always succeed at that. And it'd be arrogant of us to think that we do so even most of the time. But here we see the gravity of what we are attempting to undertake. The gravity of what our professions of faith mean. It reminds me of a guy I knew in college whose father passed on and left him his company my friend was super excited to find himself suddenly in charge of a very large, very profitable corporation. Until he realized that now it meant he had to go to work. When we profess faith in Jesus Christ as the embodiment of God's might and God's grace and pledge ourselves to be a part of the church, we're adding our names to the long line of those who have committed themselves to the serious work of building the kingdom of God. And that list begins with the name Peter. Who do we say that Jesus is? Sometimes we say Savior and consider ourselves blessed that our sins are no longer counted against us. Sometimes we say guide and friend and rejoice that when we are at our weakest point, we are not alone. But what this encounter with Jesus and Peter shows us is that when we proclaim Jesus Christ to be Messiah, the Son of God, we accept the responsibility that comes with that proclamation. Being a part of Christ's church is not primarily about what feeds us, but about allowing ourselves to be instruments by which God is building the kingdom. This whole exercise is not primarily about who has the best Sunday school classes or whose building is prettiest or whose music makes us feel the most spiritual. Those are things that may facilitate the church's work and may nourish us spiritually and help prepare us for our roles of being disciples. But the core reason for our being a part of the church of Jesus Christ is to follow in the footsteps of the first Christians who were given the privilege and the responsibility of being a part of the building of God's kingdom. Who do we say that Jesus is? Ultimately, how we answer that question says less about Jesus 
and more about us, about who we are, and about how willing we are to accept the responsibility that comes with being his disciple. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come.